Hi, this is Miss Litton, and this is seventh period review for just my tightest group of bio buddies, my committed children showing up on a Friday afternoon, bringing the heat. Say hi. Hi. All right, so this is chapter 14, biotechnology and genomics. Um, so we're just hit the big ticket items here. One thing is the idea of cloning. And if you remember in our classroom discussions, we said cloning is actually pretty common, right? What were some examples of cloning that we talked about? Bacteria. What? Bacteria? Yes, you can clone bacteria. Um, oh, shoot. Sorry, just un momento. Um, you can clone bacteria. What else? Plants. Plants get cloned all the time when you do cuttings. Yeah. Twins or clones, right? All of those are examples of cloning. So. For our purposes, when we're trying to clone, okay, we might be trying to insert a copy of a gene in something and then get more of it so that we can study that gene, maybe look at phylogeny, um, look at patterns in the genetics, or we're trying to code for some sort of protein product from that gene. All right, so it's protein product. So then um, we also mentioned gene therapy, but this is part of the introduction. But remember, what were the two types of gene therapy? In vivo and ex vivo. So in in vivo, you're adding it directly to them, right, through maybe an inhaler or a shot. But this right here, they're showing you an example of what? Not in vivo, but ex vivo, because they pulled the cells out, they're treating them and returning them. All right, and viruses are often used for that because viruses jump in and out of living things DNA all the time. So you're just using that for, to repurpose it. Now, um, we talked about how transgenic organisms have DNA from a different source, right? Um, usually you don't make transgenic people. Um, the basic uh, biology behind genetic engineering, um, you have recombinant DNA techniques. And in recombinant, what do we hear? Recombine. Recombine, okay. And then you have the polymerase chain reaction. Now, in recombinant DNA techniques, you need some sort of vector to move DNA from one place to another. Just like you have a thumb drive and you could move it. I mean, now we don't because we use Google Drive. But do you remember a thumb drive? So you could use it from one computer to another computer. Um, so plasmids and viruses are good vectors. Um, in our labs, we'll be using plasmids because they're easy to manipulate. Now, there are two enzymes, remember, that we use for recombinant DNA technology. One cuts, say my name, say my name. Restriction, Restriction enzymes cut. And what makes them work so well is they cut at a what? Specific series of bases. Those are the things you're going to want to know. What do you call that specific series of bases that those enzymes cut at? Sticky ends. Now you'll create sticky ends. Where do you call when you are cutting them? What is that series of bases called? Do you remember? Recognition sequence. Make sure to highlight that. Okay? That's easy to remember because recognition, that um, restriction enzyme, right, has got to recognize the bases it can cut at. Recognition sequence, series of bases. Oftentimes, they are a palindrome. Yes, when they do cut, they will create sticky ends. But the series of bases that it cuts at is called the recognition sequence. Now, they don't have to cut like this. They could make a blunt cut cutting straight across. That's just not as useful in genetic engineering because then you can't mix and match, right? The whole idea, what makes this very elegant, is if you cut two different DNAs with the same same restriction enzymes, then you have the same sticky ends exposed so that you can mix and match DNA from two different sources. Okay, now, as far as the stickiness is because they want to form what kind of bonds? Hydrogen bonds. So that is the first part for you to bring the fragments of DNA together. But what you need to do is you need to seal the bond right here, right here. You need to seal that phosphate sugar backbone of the DNA, and that's what you use ligase for, okay? So recombinant DNA techniques, number one, using restriction enzymes and ligase, right? And you can mix and match your DNA. All right, um, what would be the purpose of that? Well, 
you may want to cut open a plasmid with a restriction enzyme and put a human gene in there, seal it with ligase, put that plasmid into your bacterial cell, have that bacterial cell make clones of itself, and then you can either harvest the DNA for study, or you could harvest the uh, product, which would be more likely. Because if I just wanted more DNA, what's the other recombinant DNA technique I could do? I could do the what? Polymerase chain reaction if I just want more DNA. Yes? Um, so you mentioned like the blunt end. So if you, if the restriction enzyme makes a blunt end, would you still be able to do like the nope. recombinant? Yeah, that's why you wouldn't use those. The only reason you would do a blunt end cut is if you were just trying to break DNA up into sections um, that you were gonna do gel electrophoresis on, right? You weren't trying to mix and match. You were just cutting it into sections or something, okay? All right, um, one thing we mentioned though, if you are going to use a prokaryotic cell to express a eukaryotic gene, we have to consider the way they express and work within those limits, right? So one of the things we said, one of the things we said is bacterial cells in their DNA, they do not have any introns. So our genes, remember how much of our genes are full of introns? Do you remember that stat? It's like 95% introns, right? Within a single gene, like you're saying, this is my gene. 95% of his introns, and we have to cut those out during what kind of control? post-transcriptional control, right? They don't do that. So you've got to give them a clean copy, no introns in whatever gene that you give them, okay? A strategy for doing that clean copy, okay, is to use rescript, uh, reverse transcriptase. Who has reverse transcriptase? Where did that originate? Retroviruses. Yeah, retroviruses. So they already have the they don't have cells, but they already have the machinery to take RNA and reverse it right back into DNA and can insert it in a host. So what you use is use that enzyme, just like we're using all these other enzymes we got from living things, and make a clean copy of DNA minus the introns. Okay. And then last but not least, you, you need a vector to get it in there and it needs to be able to um, get in a spot where you have regulatory regions where you can turn that gene on. So you've got to get it in the middle of a what? Well, how do prokaryotic cells control their genes? Operons. Yeah, through operons. So you've got to get it in the middle of an operon. Good. All right. Now, the next um, strategy, okay, um, is the polymerase chain reaction. So this purpose of doing this and the machine you do it in is called a thermocycler. The purpose of this is to get uh, more copies of the DNA that you have. And it's basically a DNA photocopy machine in the sense that the thermocycler, it's cycling through hot and cold temperatures. When you elevate the temperature that the DNA is in, what will it tend to do when you elevate it? Yeah, do what helicase does, unwind and unzip, right? It denatures. It brings them to, from being double-stranded to what? Single-stranded. And as long as you have added in a primer, now, not primase, not the enzyme, okay? But the primers you want, you have multiple copies, fragment primers that will go to where you want the DNA polymerase three to start working. So you have primers, so they'll anneal to wherever they're complementary, right? And then, the DNA polymerase three can work off that primer to make complementary on both strands you've just created. Okay, when you are done, you have just doubled your DNA. Time to heat up again and denature and double your DNA again. And you just keep repeating the process as long as you have enough nucleotides for DNA polymerase to use and enough primers to keep the party going. Okay, so that is how you can get multiple copies of DNA. Okay, I'm still recording. All right, so, oh, whoops, sorry. So that is like a DNA photocopy machine. Now, remember we said the hurdle we would run into is if DNA denatures when you elevate the temperature, then what else could denature? Yeah, the enzyme. So that's why we get the DNA polymerase three from Thermos, Thermos aquaticus, which is an archaean bacteria who is used to living and survives in really hot temperatures. 
So that's where you get your enzyme. And there aren't any other enzymes in there, right? We're not using the primase. We're not using DNA polymerase one because we're not using the primase, right? So we don't need any of that. We don't need ligase, okay? Because it's just making one strip of DNA and we're gonna separate them right out again and make another strip. We're not sealing it to another segment. We have no lagging strands. We have no primer that we eliminated. So we, can, we don't need that, that enzyme. The only enzyme we need is DNA polymerase three. <coughs> Now, what can we do with these copies of DNA? Well, we can compare that DNA, look at evolutionary history, the phylogeny of organisms. We can identify disease. We can identify cancer. We can play who's your daddy. We can play who's the murderer. There are multiple things we can do with that DNA if we have multiple copies of it. And one of the tools you use is gel electrophoresis because gel electrophoresis will sort DNA according to size. And the premise is this. We circle back around and grab our recombinant DNA techniques that we discussed earlier. And the idea is if you have similar DNA or identical DNA because you are the same individual, the perpetrator, whatever it is you're looking for, then the restriction enzymes will cut your DNA, that DNA and whatever you're analyzing DNA in the same places, right? Because it will have the same what? Where do, where do the restriction enzymes cut? We'll have the same recognition sequences in the same places. So when you cut that DNA, you'll get the same size fragment. Then all you need to do is find out what size fragments do I have. So you load those DNAs into gels. Gels are very thin, expensive gelatin. Small samples into the well holes. You turn on an electric current. The DNA that is in there, because it's cut, is going to be negatively charged. So you just need to make sure this is the positive end and this is the negative end. And the DNA will move itself through the gel. And the, uh, the idea is a gelatin is a sugar forest, basically. And that smaller pieces of DNA would be able to move what? Faster than larger pieces of DNA. So they're going to move. You know, if you have something that's a thousand base pairs long, it's gonna move as fast as another fragment that's a thousand base pairs long. It's gonna move faster than, a ba than if you have 1,200 base pairs, right? You with me on that? A thousand base pairs will move farther down in the gel than one with 1,200, and one that's 4,000 base pairs will move what? Much slower. So what you end up getting are these banding patterns. And then you can look for similarities in those banding patterns to determine relatedness, okay? And that is what you would call DNA profiling. That is a fingerprint you cannot get rid of. And the reason is that DNA is in every cell in your body. And so all you need to do is have a sample of cells. You could go run tests off my coffee mug, right? Because what do I have all over this coffee, coffee mug? My saliva, I have lip cells, so you take a sample off here, you could go find that, right? So I would not be surprised, and this was from the movie Gattaca, you go out with somebody, right, why they get up and go to the bathroom, you have your little forensic kit, rub it on the side, you know, of their glass, you don't even have to kiss them, okay? Put it back in, easy peasy lemon squeezy, go get their DNA run, and if they have a bunch of genetic diseases in their family or they says they're gonna be ax murderers, it's not. But if it did, then you could say, oh, sorry, um, hashtag deal breaker. Okay, it's not gonna work out with you. That is gonna happen, but the scary part is not only could you judge somebody else, but they could judge you. judge you. So maybe you apply for a job and you don't willfully give your DNA sample, it would not be hard to get a sample. You sent in your resume, let's say with an envelope, they can get it off the saliva residue that's still on the label. You see what I'm saying? They could get a sample. They could offer you, would you like some water during the interview? They could take it off the glass of water. Okay, so right now, some people, like you're supposed to be 18 years of age to use 23andMe or any of those things, but parents are making up names and running their kids' DNA through those. So the seven-year-old didn't get an option to choose whether or not they wanted their DNA out in the stratosphere. Their parents did it for them. They didn't get to wait till they were 18 to decide. And you can't control yourselves, right? If you walk into my bathroom, 
I bet you could go like this on the floor and pick up a whole bunch of hair, <laughs> right? Hair follicles and then boom, you got it, right? It's very easy to get somebody's DNA. You could walk past them and just scratch them and you'd have DNA underneath your fingernail. So the reason why you need to, the reason why you need to understand this is because these are things you're gonna be voting on. These are bioethical issues you're gonna be voting on. Who gets to know the information? What do they get to do about it or with it? All right? Now, another thing we discussed um, is just the, um, when we look, we need to remember that there are two sources of DNA within our cells. There's our nuclear DNA, which is comprised of both our, what we receive from our biological mother and biological father, right? But we also have, um, we also have our mitochondrial DNA, and our mitochondrial DNA always comes from our mother. Okay. Then um, the next thing we did is we just went through a series of examples of genetically engineered organisms. We looked at a lot of different things you could do with bacteria, whether you made plants frost resistant, degraded oil, or you got them to produce medicines for you. Same thing with plants. You could genetically engineer plants to produce medicines. You could make them insecticide, uh, make their own insecticide. You could genetically engineer new plants that haven't existed in the past, like the pomato. Um, and um, there are several genetically modified plants that are already out there. One thing we looked at is we, we said there's a lot of dangers associated with genetically modified um, organisms, allergens, you can't contain them. But we looked at an example where they're trying to genetically engineer potatoes from a wild version to make them resistant to blight so that it doesn't wipe out potatoes like in Ireland because remember they had to have their spuds. All right, transgenic animals, much more difficult. Don't have a high success rate on that because somehow you've got to get the DNA into a cell, okay? And this can't be an old cell. It has to be a young cell that you genetically engineer, preferably at the level of an egg that you genetically, a, a fertilized egg that you would genetically engineer. Once you have engineered that, which is fairly tricksy, okay, then you want to put that egg into a host um, organism, and then it gives birth to this genetically engineered transgenic, let's say, goat. But now this goat can't have sex with other goats because then you're gonna, right? You're gonna increase the variety. Yes. Um, okay, so this question's kind of weird, but like, so the milk has like human bone in it, right? So yes. if you make something out of the milk, like a cake, would it still have? It would have human growth bone in it, absolutely. Even if it has the other ingredients? Yep. It mm -hmm. would still like work. Yeah, yeah. So the thing you would have to check for that is how we absorb that. Like, you can put hormones or drugs just on your skin and you can absorb it. Not everything, right? So you would have to know how would the human growth hormone be affected by the human digestive system, right? You'd have to consider that. You'd have to go, okay, oh, will my enzymes digest or decrease it or do I need to get it straight to the blood, right? You have to think, how will you get it in your system? And then we said you would need to make clones of that transgenic goat to get more and then you would enucleate some eggs, put a cell from your first cloned organism in them, and that's how you would pass it on. We have seen examples of this in mice, the Siri gene, which makes them male, they have transplanted from a male mice into a female mouse, and she was still sterile, but she did develop all the male structures. Um, okay, then um, we already talked about gene therapy, so I'm just gonna Put those there in case you want to pause and take a quick look at that, all right? But then we got into genomics. And basically in genomics, yes? Uh, for the Siri gene, where is it located? On the Y chromosome. On the Y chromosome. Yeah, that's what makes males male. If you took a zygote and removed the Siri gene, you would, had that individual would develop like as a Turner syndrome. So if you have like a, Double X with the surgeon, like is it possible Still male. Yeah. Yeah. Literally, you could put it anywhere. Okay. Yeah, and it's going to get transcribed and translated. What would be really weird is to put it on one of the X because we're mosaic, so some parts might be male, some female. I'm just throwing it out. Okay. Um, so, 
we we talked about a lot of things with genomics, a lot of different things about genomics. So let's just tag some. One, we said they were trying to just straight up sequence the DNA, thought that would be the be all, end all, is just having the sequence. So that was first, okay? Then came ideas of the looking at differences between humans. I mean, you could compare us to other organisms, but then you could compare humans. As I look around the room at all the beautiful people in this room, um, we all look a little bit different from each other, right? So what, what genes are different amongst us to call the, cause these differences? And that one, that's when we started talking about the single nucleotide polymorphism. And we said, of those single nucleotide polymorphisms, which is most of our differences, um, it could be a what? Silent, could cause no difference between us. Um, it could cause a variation that's not harmful, okay? Um, it could cause a nonsense mutation where all of a sudden you have a what? Stop codon. Or a missense mutation where you have the wrong, amino wrong amino acid, which doesn't have to end badly if it acts and folds the protein in the same way. Okay, then we said, okay, so these are single nucleotide polymorphisms. This would, could be, let's say, in a gene, per se. But then we said there are areas outside of the gene, intergenic region, right? So when somebody identifies something as a gene, you are saying it is a gene because it codes for mRNA and because you can make, use that mRNA to build a what? Yeah. When you look on your DNA, remember how much of our DNA is actually genes that we express? 1%, okay? So of our human genome, only 1% is actually expressed as a what? Protein. So everybody else is like, what's all the rest? You know, bad housekeeping, which is true. We are bad housekeepers when it comes to our DNA. They could be failed attempts at evolution. They could be mistakes. There are spaces between genes called intergenic. Then there are, are spaces within a gene. What do we call the ones within a gene? Intragenic. Okay. And then we have to come to the realization that we maybe need to shift our paradigm about the central dogma. And the central dogma says DNA codes for RNA, use the RNA to build a protein. We need to shift our paradigm because maybe some of these things intragenic, intergenic are control or regulatory. Or maybe the purpose of that DNA is to code for some type of RNA. RNA. It could be small nuclear RNA. It could be interfering RNA. Any kind of RNA that impacts what we call genes, right? The end product may not be a protein. The end product may be purposefully an RNA. But our, our ideas of a gene are limited to things that have code for a protein. Or maybe it codes, when we talk about proteins too, we need to think about the importance of how proteins are what? Folded into functionality. And anything that affects that would be critical. Yes? So in intergenic regions, like, would that be where, like, I guess, would that be considered like the gene that codes, or the um, DNA that codes for rRNA? Because rRNA is an mRNA. Right, exactly. Good, good, good pull. I love it. Yeah, so there, there are repeating units in there. They look like they do nothing. It may just contribute to the structure of the chromosome. Remember when we talked about telomeres? And every single time your DNA replicates, your telomeres get a little bit shorter unless you have a problem with telomerase and you keep adding and then you're probably going to have cancer, right? So we just need to be aware that some of these um, um, single nuclear polymorphisms, they could be in the gene, right, intragenic or outside of the gene, intragenic, and maybe regulatory, okay? And then um, we kind of looked at, okay, you know, we got all these jumping genes, things in the gene, um, things in between the gene, we've got duplications, and here's this little bit that we express. Okay, then we leveled up to some newer um, DNA biotechnology, and we started talking about CRISPR. Now, the part of CRISPR that is the same of what we've discussed before is, basically, when you look at Cas9, Cas9 is still a what? 
scissor. It's just this scissor is guided to where it cuts by a guiding what? RNA. So again, also discovered, just like restriction enzymes, discovered by bacteria part of their immune response. In fact, probably part of their adaptive immune response. So you have this guiding RNA that leads you to this area to cut. So then we can do so much there. We can change the guide, keep the cutter, and cut where we want to cut, right? Or keep the guide, and you could change the cutter to where it can't cut, but instead you attach a different enzyme onto it that doesn't cut but fixes that single nucleotide polymorphism that was giving you cancer or some disease. Or maybe you inactivate, it's a knockout. You inactivate a gene that is behaving inappropriately. Maybe you turn on a gene that wasn't there before. Maybe you label a gene with fluorescence. Basically, this is the, the CRISPR is something that can give us a guide to manipulating our DNA, which is not something we readily could do before. Right? We just could not access that to regulate it, to change it. And again, huge bioethical issues around that. Who gets to, know, who gets to do this? What do they get to produce? How is it released you know, into the world? How could we contain it or control it? What's bioethically right and wrong on that? So those are all things that need to be explored. Um, also, oh, and I already talked about this, revisiting the central dogma when we talked about this before. Um, I talked about the genetic profile where literally people can make these assays where they have all the human DNA, single-stranded, and on one microscope slide. Take your DNA, single-stranded, cut it up, see where it binds. Where it binds, I can tell you what genes you have. I can tell you what diseases you might get or not get, right? just like that. But all of these things, if you remember, I was telling you, a lot of this is leading to personalized medicine. And probably a lot of research is gonna be underneath the umbrella of that, but could people be using it for evil too? Yes, that's why you need to be scientifically literate so you can vote on these things. Yes? So for like this, um, this slide, so how do, they, how do they know that? Like how are they finding out if you have the mutation or not? Is it just like there's the- Okay, the so, this is how I would say. Now, obviously, I can't draw a slide <laughs> with all of our human DNA on it, okay? And they have all these little spots of the DNA, right? So I'm just gonna take one of those spots and blow it up. And basically, what they would have there is they'd have some single-stranded DNA, okay? Maybe it goes A, T, G, C, G, C, A, A, right? Let's say that's a gene that causes cystic fibrosis. So if you have DNA that's complementary to that, I know you have cystic fibrosis. You see how that works? You're basically making it so you're saying if you attach, uh-oh, you know, or if you're not attaching, then probably you're, you have a mutation. So that's a way to find everything out. You know, and it's not hypothetical, it's real. Your DNA either matches it or it's not complement, complementary or not complementary to it. Okay, and then we closed up with proteomics, just having the appreciation to understand. You have a strand of nucleotides that's just really a starting point. The folding is so critical. You could have all the right nucleotides in a row, but if you don't fold it into the correct shape, it's not going to be able to do its job. So people are studying that. And remember, the proteome is bigger than the genome. Why? Why is the proteome bigger than the genome? Exon recombination. Exon recombination, baby. Perfect. Okay? So depending on how you put the genes together, you can get multiple proteins from one gene. Bioinformatics, which sounds like stupid when you just say, oh, it's using a computer to study genomes. Okay. It is using like supercomputers to study genomes. It is comparing and contrasting DNA. It's finding out what you have and what that can cause. So that is a whole field to study as well. And then our expansion of genomics is, we know genes code for proteins, we know there are sections of DNA that interrupt and separate genes, and the proteins that encode and adhere to that DNA. We have to look at what is controlling this entire process.
process. And then I think that was it. I had some practice questions though that I didn't get to, I think, in fifth period. Starting here, if you would like to do them, start, yeah, it starts right here. Right here, you can log in. And I will show the questions up on the board as well. Login is whatever nickname you would like to log in as. Meh. Here, I'm going to wait for some of you to get in and then I'll get you out. You ready? Okay, there you go. Okay, 878-464. I'm going to start. Still 878-464, and I'm going to show the question. So at home, you can look at it as well. And then you, if you want to pause it to answer it, because I'm going to pause this just for a minute, here is question number two. All right, I hope it isn't late Sunday night when you're watching this. I hope you've studied earlier than late Sunday night. <laughs> All right, um, I'm gonna go back to question one and I'm gonna stop it. Okay, sorry if I kicked you out. Which statement is true? Yes, plasmids can serve as vectors. Plasmids can carry recombinant DNA, but viruses cannot. Yes, all things can carry, you know, plas plasmids and viruses are both vectors. They can both carry that recombinant DNA because I could have genetically engineered it and then given it to that virus. Yes. Um, so when it says vectors carry only foreign genes, so wait, I know that's not true, but like what else is there? Oh, okay, so I'm on that one. Okay, but we understand oh. B, yeah? <coughs> C, vectors carry only the foreign gene? No, you, it can, remember when we watched, if, second period, we didn't get to watch that video about the, the potato famine, but they and um, they were carrying just a wild type. It does that sometimes. So foreign genes only be from a different species altogether. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. And question number two: Which of these is not needed to clone an animal? Yeah, you don't need the sperm because to clone that animal, you're taking that cell's complete diploid cell and putting it in another organism, right? Okay. Then we had another one right here and I'm going to start that show question that is question one and here is question two Okay. All right. I hope you have a good, uh, you're going to do something fun birthday weekend. I'm talking to Ms. Fowler. You're on YouTube, by the way. You're on YouTube. Poetry Project. Poetry Project. <laughs> oh, I think I threw up in my mouth a little bit. No, it would be fun to read all your poetry. <laughs> I started writing poetry this year. I never write poetry. Sometime maybe I will share a poem that I have written. No. It was about life. Okay, let's check it out. Um, gene therapy is still an investigative procedure. Yeah, you can't just go, hey, Kaiser Permanente, I would like to do my gene therapy treatment. <laughs> it's not going to happen yet. It has met with some success. It has used to do other things other than the ones listed there in C. And it makes use of viruses to carry foreign genes into human cells. You know why? Because that's what viruses do. So just repurpose them to help us. Okay, question number two. What is the benefit of using a retrovirus? It incorporates foreign gene into the host chromosome. That is what it does. Okay, um, it doesn't eliminate unnecessary steps. There's still a ton of steps. It doesn't prevent any other infection by viruses. Okay, you're just, you're just giving it to that person. Yes? So um, for the viruses, so like, is that like why, so like if you get like stomach virus or something like that, is it, so is that like DNA from a virus always gonna be in you? 
Yeah, and we're gonna talk about that next chapter that we didn't get. Yeah, we'll talk about that on Monday. Okay, all right, um, next set, I think, I think, I think, I think, hey. Are you going? I am going, Okay. yeah. And that is the end. But let me add here on the end, potential essays. Should we do that? Okay, so one thing I would do is I might ask you, what are the steps to incorporate a human gene into a bacterium? Right? So you would have, I would include how you need a clean copy and the steps of getting a clean copy. I would, you know, include the use of restriction enzymes. You would need to talk about recognition sequences. You would need to talk about restriction enzymes, you know, how they work, and ligase. And how you would need to get, you know, uh, get that plasmid into the bacteria, you know, that transformative part. Okay. Another thing I would ask is I would ask, um, what are the steps of uh, PCR, of the polymerase chain reaction? And then I would want you to know some purposes, why it might be of value, what you would use it for specifically. I might specifically ask a question like, how could you play who's your daddy using DNA technology? And in there, you would probably need to mention the process of gel electrophoresis, yes? Okay, I might ask, and as a part two to any of those questions, what are some examples in different, completely different organisms of recombinant technology? You know, like what, what have they genetically engineered? And I might ask, because CRISPR is like a big deal, to explain the steps of CRISPR and at least three different ways you could use it. Bozeman has a video on CRISPR. And how, why might we change the central dogma or our view of the central dogma? One of you has typed this up, and did one of you type up the last ones I had? Yeah, can you combine those and send them to me so I will pick from these questions that I'm actually saying? <laughs> because then when I when I get home and I'm writing a test, I'm like, hmm, what do I want to know? <laughs> okay, um, I think that's it. You got it? Feel strong? Proud of you coming in on a Friday afternoon. You guys are awesome. Awesome, awesome, awesome. Where are the rest of you? Okay, love you.